Does it come up or do you want to answer questions at the end? Doesn't matter to me. It's of okay. no, no consequence. Okay, that's fine. In, in, as a practical matter, I don't think there's, you know, it's going to be a problem. We'll probably just answer them at the end. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So let's uh, make sure everyone's in. Okay, we've got got about everyone now. Well, go ahead. Yep, go ahead. Welcome back, everyone. This is the last session of this year's Scheme and Functional Programming Workshop. And so we have two invited talks. We have Jerry Sussman giving a talk on layering the architecture of programs. And we also have John Cowan giving a talk on the R7RS process. And so John was going to go first, but through the magic of time zones and scheduling uh, mix-ups and things like that, I did not correctly communicate which time zone uh, or which time. So uh, John is going to go after Jerry's talk. And uh, so we'll still have the same talks. So they'll just be in reverse order. All right. And so without any further ado, let me quickly introduce Jerry, which I think everyone in Scheme Workshop probably knows Jerry, but Jerry co-created Scheme in 1975 and is famous for the Lambda, the ultimate papers and many other things and has been programming for a very long time and been at MIT for a very long time. And with no further ado, Jerry, why don't you let us know about layering? Okay. Want me to start? Please, please do. Okay. So anyway, what I want to talk about is something I've never talked about in, per in public before. This is a, so this is a ho almost hot out of the gray matter talk. Okay. Just to make it clear. So be, please be patient with the fact that I might not have got everything under control. Okay. Mostly, first, let's start out with what my big goal is. The goal is that I want to make systems that are easy to change. Okay. And what I mean by is that they should be easily adapted to unforeseen needs. Okay. They should be flexible. They should be incremental. And they should be able to suppress detail. That's a complicated thing. Okay, and I'm, I'm worried about it, but I think it's also important to realize the context. The context is that we have barely know how to program. Consider biological genome, our genome, the genome, the human genome. It's a gigabyte of ROM, but it builds a complicated machine like us, which lasts for a reasonable length of time, like a little more than 70 years. Okay, it's a very complex machine. It builds it, but they, it builds it from a single cell, okay? It operates that machine for the approximately 70 years. It, it, it fights off other similar things that want to eat it, okay? And it's very flexible. Change a few bytes in it somewhere, and all of a sudden you got a rabbit instead of a person, okay? We, so we don't have a program. That's the first order of business. But of course, nature has figured this out over a billion years, so <laughs> we, we should at least say we're doing okay. The other thing I want to say is that programs are a kind of expressive medium like math and poetry and prose and art and music. I find programming to be a, a way I tend to express myself. I think it's an art form when I write code. Okay. And I spend a lot of time worrying about making it understandable and pretty and elegant in some way. Okay. But the most important thing is that's a way by which we can say things we can't say otherwise. So, so sometimes it's very hard to write something down and because we don't have the right language to say it. Programming gives us new kind of language for describing, describing how we solve problems, how we do things, basically the generalization of recipes. But uh, the way our programming languages are and our programming styles are rather ponderous. And so we don't really like, I don't really want, I think we have to fix that and improve it. Okay, let me give you an example. Now, remember, I'm an electrical engineer, according to the official rules. So that's my, my official title, Panasonic Professor of Electrical Engineering. And uh, so I'm gonna show you an example that's basically from electrical engineering to start with. So here's a, a stupid little program that uh, computes the current through a junction diode, given the voltage across the diode. Okay, but that's a, that program is really, really simple and is really, really elegant and understandable. Of course, I've wrote it in infix, it would have fewer characters, 
but it would be, but, but that's a different problem. I don't like, I don't like infix, but in any case, uh, you know, I want to say things about this program. I want to say that these are all inexact numbers. They have specified uncertainties. I, gee, I don't, I don't know where I can't, I don't know where I can put that. Okay. There are units. The voltage is V, v is in volts. IS is the saturation current is in amperes. Q is in coulombs. T is kelvins. K is in joules per kelvin. Okay. And the result is in amperes. I also want to say where these ideas come from. IS came from the manufacturer of the of the diode that was International Rectifier Company, and Q and K come from the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology. And I happen to measure T in my, uh, you know, with a the thermometer, uh, in in the room I'm in. And the formula comes from Searle and Gray, okay, which is a famous book on electrical circuits. And this program, I wrote it, so I, I'm going to take respons re re take responsibility for it. There are also reasonable constraints. For example, the voltage, it could be maybe up to minus 100 volts, but it can't, it's almost impossible to be greater than one volt because because it's an exponential. So if I put a volt across this uh, diode, a zillion amps are going to go through it, and it's going to, certainly smoke's going to come out. Okay, so that's that's the sort of um, the sort of things I want to be able to do. Now, I want to say that here's, I want more. I want somehow all of that stuff to work. I want to be able to check my units in reasonable constraints at runtime and compile time when that's possible. I want to be able to symbolically evaluate this as well as numerically. I want an, an estimate of the uncertainty of the result. That's one I don't know how to deal with very much. That's very hard. Okay. In fact, that one I, I don't know at all how to deal with. I want the tracking of dependencies. So if I get a wrong answer, I would know who's to blame. It could be me, but I want to know. I want automatic derivatives and integrals. Of course, you've heard about automatic differentiation here, but I, I've been doing that for a long time, okay? And I want derivatives and integrals that inherit the annotations, just like knowing about the units and things like that. So if I'm integrating with respect to time, it's the, it's the integrand multiplied by time as the units of the result. I want these emendations to be additive, incremental, require almost no change to my code. And the most important thing is I don't want my simple and easy to read program to be buried in a mess of declarations that make it impossible to read. I don't want to invent Java, okay? What I don't want to say is a, a, a language where you have ceremonies required to get it to work, okay? You know, incantations, okay? Now, I don't know all the answers, okay? In fact, uh, I don't know most of them. So in order to get to, to get it out off our chests, uh, Chris Hansen and I, who have together uh, over 100 years of programming experience, uh, decided to write a book, okay, which I will call SDF here, okay. And today I'm going to talk about a very underdeveloped idea from our book, which is called layering, okay. Just just read. This is not intended to be a book a, a book plug, okay. I just have to tell you what, what I'm doing, okay? Okay, so here. First thing in this book that's relevant is that we did a lot of predicate dispatch extensible, extensible generic procedures. This turns out to be a very big, important thing, okay? And it's got lots of history. There's people like, what's his first name? I can't remember. Tessman's first name. He wrote a paper in... Uh, I can't even remember. He wrote a paper way back in the 90s. Okay. SICM, the book I wrote with Jack Wisdom um, about the classical mechanics, uh, is we, we use extensible generics to do all of our, our work. Okay. Um, you know, and uh, I suppose Michael Ernst wrote a rather nice paper uh, about, about how to do that efficiently. And that was way back in the 90s, all of those. But you see, in, the, in this, in this book, we set the stage how to generalize arithmetic to include arithmetic on symbolic expressions, on functions, and even literal functions. And we can extend it further to things like vectors and matrices and all that stuff. But the most interesting thing here is something which I do in, uh, in that book, in, in chapter three, which I show how to make automatic differentiation actually work by a generic extension of the arith arithmetic primitives to differential objects.
And here's the trick right here. It's very simple. And I will just explain it again because it's going to lead into something interesting. But I wanted to say that Mark and Barack and his friends have clarified this stuff amazingly. I started doing this in 1992, dealing with that, and basically preparation for working on some classical mechanics stuff with my friend Jack Wisdom, including teaching a class. But I didn't really understand it all. And I have to admit that uh, I was greatly debugged partly by, uh, by what uh, Mark and Barack and his friends did. Okay, and of course, Alexei Radul, one of my former students who we overlapped with Barack. But in any case, going back here, what we have is a special data structure, which of course, mathematically is called a, a dual number, but I'm, I'm just writing, I'm gonna call it the, co the compound thing is a, a differential object. It's like a complex number, okay? Such that I'm extending all the primitives so that I produce both the, comp the function value and the derivative multiplied by the, the previous uh, second part of this one, which I call the infinitesimal part, okay? And thus, that's, that's the chain rules automatically works very well because uh, the, when I apply g to one of these, I get g of f of x, which is the correct value for the, the composition, and the derivative of g at f of x times the derivative of f at x times the, times the uh, initial value that came in, okay? That's, this is, a, this is a, a really great idea. It was certainly not invented by me. Uh, although I accidentally, let's just say I, when I, I did it, I didn't know that anybody else had done it. Okay. It's just because I'm not a scholar of, of computer science. I do know a lot about physics and, and other parts of mathematics and electrical engineering, but you know, I'm not a computer scientist. I'm an electrical engineer and I like to build stuff. So anyway, the, so we use the, we did in, in the SICM stuff, uh, the, and in the book, we show the, we use the most general predicate dispatch on multiple arguments, okay? And we show how that can be made efficient, but we use it for even these differential objects. But I want you to note something about this differential object, okay? The interesting thing is that automatic differentiation is computing two things. It's not the same thing as a complex number where the two things mix, generally. This is, this is x goes to f of x, so I'm computing f, Basically, I'm computing the base computation and the derivative, okay, at each step, okay? Ah, so that's slightly different, and that's why I want to go to here. Layering is not just generic procedures. With generic procedures, here's what I'm talking about. We extend a procedure so it can operate on data. By the way, normally, when I give a class, there would be no, no words here. This is because I'm on a, on a screen. Okay, I don't like doing that. I don't like I mean, this. Would be, I'd be mostly at a blackboard, at the chalkboard, uh, writing on the chalkboard and talking to you. But in fact, uh, in the case of uh, an online presentation, it seemed to me that I should give you the words as well. With generic procedures, we extend a procedure so it can operate on data that could not have been operated on before the extension. Like, for example, we can extend addition to append strings when applied to strings. With, and that's so it's a it's a, a thing that change that's used on a piece of data in a way that it gets you a new thing it's only one thing being computed with layering data potentially has metadata associated with it and the procedures are extended to operate on the metadata as well as the data in parallel thus for example when we add a units layer that's for computing units we send multiplication to the multiplication of the data and to produce the, the units for the product of course the metadata may have its own data Okay, whoops. And uh, although we impl implemented the automatic differentiation as a generic extension of arithmetic, it can also be implemented as a layer because the automatic differentiator must compute the value of the, as well as the derivative to make the chain rule work. I mean, just going back there to see why, okay, it's because the value over here, okay, that f of x had to make it into as an argument for g of f of x. Okay, and over here, for dg of f of x. Okay, so let's go back to the, pro the, the problem I started with here. Here's a ordinary trivial computation, which we know, okay? This is what you could just do and you assume you can do, okay? So we've got a, a saturation current of about 10 to the minus 13th amperes, okay, for a typical diode. Uh, we have uh, the charge on an electron, the Boltzmann's constant, and the temperature. 
And if I compute, I have ask ID at 0.6 volts, which is a plausible voltage, then I'm getting one milliamp approximately. Okay. I think it's a, uh, this is a, for one of those who are interested, is probably a one, one in 4,001. <laughs> okay. The manufacturer has specified the uh, saturation card. So now I'm going to add provenance. And this is literally what I type. Okay. So I'm going to say, I'm going to sign the, 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 the saturation current value and set that they re, re, rename it back to IS. Okay. But I'm going to sign it by, I, by the International Rectifier Corporation. Okay. I'm going to sign the physical constants with NIST. I got them from, not, from the code data, data set from NIST from 2006. Okay. And I measured the temperature, so I signed that by me. Okay. I'm also going to put in the, the, uh, the fact that the 0.6 volts is signed by me. And guess what? Now I get two pieces of information out. I get the provenance, which is the set of support. Okay. These are the guys it depended upon. Okay. Therefore, if something's wrong, it's got, uh, this value is because of one of those. And the, and the base computation is base is what we had would have gotten anyway. Okay. So that's just, just showing you how it works. Okay. Now I could do more than that. I might want to say where the formula came from. Okay. It came from the formula, for example, came from the famous book. I just want to get my notes over here. Yes. Searle and Gray. Okay. Which is a very famous uh, book written sort of in the seventies, I think maybe the sixties even. <clears throat> and uh, it's a, so I'm, I'm going to say that the result, which is basically the formula is, is by Searle and Gray. Okay. In which case now, if I ask the question, indeed, I, uh, I get the, 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 that added to the, to the provenance. But notice if I don't sign the 0.6 volts that I'm putting in, if I just give it this, this value, ID, there's no reason to compute any of that internal provenance because there's nothing to combine it with. Okay. The V, the V won't have any provenance. And therefore, it's not worthwhile propagating any of the provenance. And they were just say, oh, well, Searle and Gray told me the answer. Okay? So I just want to see that right now. However, if I am the programmer, I can sign the procedure, which I did. Okay? I'm going to sign it. And by doing so, I'm accepting responsibility for the way the computation is done in that procedure. So the internal details can be suppressed because you can blame me, okay? As, as the result has then multiple levels, the application of the signed procedure to its arguments and the resulting value signed by the formula author, which is a different thing. There's the author of the formula over here and the author of the, the and the, the, per, the person who wrote the code, as well as the person who handed in the, uh, handed in the, the argument. Okay, but even still, uh, if the argument is is not signed, then only then only the value is signed. Okay, so this is the kind of the kind of thing that matters, and I can do this with easily with this. What you're seeing here is support sets. Okay, basically provenance, but I can do this with units. That's easy too, and I can and and they add it together. If I add units to the system, all that you would see here is more, lay, la, la, more lines in the answer, okay? And the reason why I didn't do that for this is because slides only contain a certain amount of information. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I didn't want to cover it up with junk. Okay, so there's, so this is a, this is in some sense incremental and additive, but the nice thing is it's not screwing up my program. My program has got only a little bit added to it, the signature right there, okay? The thing is basically untouched. I don't have a very large set of declarations here. The declarations are outside. Okay. But you see, real programs are more complicated. So I wanted to show what you get. They have conditionals and loops. And conditionals are interesting and screw things up a bit. Okay. Uh, and that's a good it's a good thing. And that's one of the one of the challenges here. But I got it right. Okay. But one of the challenges is that in doing this, you have to do a conditionals correctly. And I'll show you later about it. But so here's just an example to show. If I have a counter, and if I say if n is zero, um, then 
of the real I'm done. Otherwise, I want n times n minus n n minus sorry n minus one signed by Bilbo. Okay. Just for fun. Now these I put in signatures all over the place here because I just wanted to see the result. So if Sam puts in a zero, he only gets GJS Frodo and Sam. Okay, that's the GJS, the Frodo, and the Sam who put in the the argument. But if if uh, Sam puts in five, he gets Bilbo as well because it goes around the loop just to see that. So the the um, so the the conditional is doing the right thing. Okay. Uh, the simplest way to make con to implement conditionals in the native language, like in Scheme, is to use a macro, which changes the, the compilation, unfortunately. And the compiler really has to depend upon if to do the right thing. Okay, So you don't want to screw up if very much. So you can worry about that. And the easy way to implement layering, which I did it by combining the results of the layers, kills tail recursion. And I want to talk about that a little later. Okay, That's a that may be an avoidable thing if we can, but there's real research to be done here. And I'm hoping that you guys help. Okay. Cause I'm just getting, getting going on this. I told you this is hot out of the gray matter. Okay. But you know, at least it works. So I decided to run, you know, a, a basically a pile of Y operator type stuff just to make sure everything is, you know, there's no bugs. Okay. So, uh, so this is of course a ridiculously, a ridiculous program, which computes, um, I suppose this is a uh, factorial, and this is Fibonacci, uh, <laughs> and I put in lots of signings, okay, just to make sure that when it comes out, yes, I get three results, the factorial, the fib of uh, Fibonacci of 10, factorial 5, Fibonacci of 10, and the sum of those two, and indeed, these are the actual correct, uh, the correct uh, provenance piece of sport sets for each of those computations, okay? Jerry, Jerry, what what is the fact colon one? Um, oh, maybe I missed that. I've seen the sign. Oh, over here. Yeah. Oh, let. Okay, uh, that's just the name of. Oh, the, oh, oh, I see. Okay, okay. okay. The yeah, there's nothing, nothing special object. about it. It's okay. the one from factorial, and the reason I, I okay. named it that way is so that I could read it at the end. Okay, that's okay. all. So that that doesn't have anything to do with the signing. That's just a, no, 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 no. Okay. That's okay. The stupid, stupid character strings when typing and stuff in. Okay. okay. Yes, and I, I the, as I said, this was all whipped together, including the code that does this, since you asked me to get, give this talk about last week. Okay, so, you know, don't, I, I would do something nicer if I had more time. That was all the best those, type of talk. Or another way to say it is that given uh, the famous line, uh, given more time, I could have written a shorter letter. Anyway, so, <laughs> unlike generic procedures, the, the thing that can see how they can, can how it relates to generic procedures. There is a single with generic procedures. There's a single here. There's a single layered object data type that is for all the layers at once. Okay, so it's basically an ordinary an ordinary object. Okay, which is a combination of the base layer and the annotation layers, and that may be a lot of my problem. Okay, it's very much like generic procedures in that a layered procedure has a handler for each layer of interest. Unlayered procedures must look at only the base layer, okay, uh, of a layered argument. This changes the language implementation slightly, okay. Most layers are self-contained, as a handler will generally not look at arguments other than the ones for its layer, but pro star multiplying from when provenance needs the base argument because what if one of the inputs to a, a multiply is zero? That That's plenty information. I don't need any more information about what the other arguments are. That's enough to force the result to be zero. Of course, if both of the, or if more than one uh, argument to a multiply is zero and they're not the same, uh, same um, support set, then I don't know what to do, okay? Because <laughs> I need an or, okay? But I'm gonna punt that one for today. Mm. A handler is will generally not be invoked unless arguments for that layer are provided, okay? And there are there's an extra thing. Defaults for missing uh, layer values have to be provided, like empty support sets, dimensionless quantities, mathematical constants, things like that. Okay. Now it's to say it's compatible with the generic procedures. In that a layered object is one for which the layered object question is true. Okay. And remember the generic procedures we do are are entirely dynamic generic procedures, uh, predicate based. Okay, which is which is uh, 
which is the most general thing you could possibly do. Okay. Um, the layered object predicate can be used as a generic for, for generic dispatch. So that means that these could be, I could have a generic system which has layered objects as one of the things that the, the procedures know what to do with. Generic procedures can therefore have handlers for layered objects. But a layered ob procedure is also a layered object. And the base procedure, the layered uh, procedure, can be a generic procedure. And the handler procedures can be layered, and the handler, handler procedures can be generic. Okay, just to give you a, you know, the sort of it fits in nicely. Now, I wrote an interpreter in scheme. The way I did this, I'm going to show you a little of it. Okay, uh, I wrote an interpreter scheme that I tweaked for layering last week or so. The interpreter is – that's not the way we do it in the book. In the book, we have a complex way of, of squeezing MIT GNU scheme to do the right thing. Okay, but that's more complex than, than writing an interpreter. So I wrote a generic continuation passing interpreter. I wrote, did it this way so the application of layered procedures and the changes to if are additive modules. So after loading the interpreter, the next few slides I see will show so, uh, what you have to set up to do this. So here I am just starting the 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 – the the embedded interpreter, the the second level interpreter, the the the, low, the interpreter that's interpreting this stuff. I have to make up a thing called provenance union, which is going to basically uh, be the union function, but it's going to be for provenance layer. Okay. I also have to tell if that it has to be able to know what to do with 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 provenance. That in other words, it has to combine the provenance of the of the result of the predicate calculation, okay, with the provenance of the uh, of the consequent, the chosen consequent or alternative, and that has to be done. Uh, so I have to, that changes if, okay. So this is a declaration, and these declarations are global declarations in the um, in the in in the global environment of the of the the, the subinterpreter, okay. Then just to say what I do here for support sets, well. You know, plus and minus just union the support sets. That's all it is. So I'm defining that to be with a new layer. And this says the procedure used. Okay. Uh, star has to look for zero in the base arguments. I did the simplest thing. I found the first zero. And uh, by the way, I, I didn't make this a, a, a abstract, you know, the abstract data. Uh, the base computation and the uh, the provenance uh, value, which is the support set, are just cons together um, in the. But the base and layer arguments are being passed along, and I have to pull this out. Okay, but that's you know you, again. This is if I wanted to make this pretty, I could do that. Okay, and there are more primitives. Divide does divide, divide does something interesting also because it worries about whether the numerator is zero. Okay. The denominator is zero will cause an error anyway, so I don't have to worry about that. <clears throat> well, signal an error, actually. And, you know, I sit around and I have to do all, all, almost everything else, including, you know, there's an identity for, for, for uh, single argument functions. The uh, providence is just propagated along. And there's, a, you know, a load of them. That's for all the primitives. Mm. Next, the hard part. This took me... <laughs> <laughs> this was this probably took me six hours just writing the procedure which signs the signs a, a, a value okay or adding a signature to a procedure I'm not going to show it to you because it's it's not very long but it was very painful okay and also printing out the results which you know showed you the two lines okay <laughs> I'm not very good at that <clears throat> the fun part's the interpreter Okay, so this is an execution engine like the ones in the in the book that, that we recently published. Uh, is continuation passing style, so it can supply reified continuations to the interpreted program. This but interpreter is not in the book, okay? But it's if you know, if you know how to write these things, they're very fast. So I started with a an evaluator, which takes an expression environment and a continuation. It's going to do an analysis of the expression. And then we produce an ex a, a, what I call an executor, an ex executor, okay, which is basically a procedure which takes an environment and a continuation, and does the work. So this is basically se separating separating out some of the what you normally think of as compilation. You could do in the analysis some, for example, uh, fooling around with what can you do? You could do things like uh, um, 
you know, like like uh, like an al analyzing expressions to find to do common sub expression elimination and stuff like that if you want, or or dead code elimination, or you know, constant folding, or all that sort of thing. Okay. So where did my mouse go? There he is. Okay. So now um, let's see. Oh yes, my mouse decided to do something. Oh, there he's back. Okay. Mice are. I, I'm not a I'm I'm a, a come on command line guy myself. Uh, I am not competent to deal with a mouse. I'm too old for that. So then, so then you notice here that uh, that I'm going to make up the the, the default, which is applications. That's what you get in, uh, in in a Lisp, and then they analyze itself as a generic procedure. So new kinds of expressions just are are declared as handlers for this generic procedure. Okay, going down the next page. Here's the default, which is a standard combination thing. Now, what I'm doing is I analyze the operator part of the expression, analyze the operators part of the expression. Okay. Now, I, here's the execution procedure. It takes an environment continuation. It has to force the, the evaluation of the operator because this system is able to also deal with lazy evaluation. So I can declare a variable to be a lazy or a lazy memo. Okay. And that's uh, so. In order to do that, I have to be able to pass all of the environment through to the uh, the apply. So apply can thunkify the various operands if it turns out it needs to be make them lazy. But that's a separate issue. So this I pulled this out of making it from another evaluator. Um, when I get the pro the the procedure part, okay, and then I have to do the apply that procedure, okay, and of course um, this is stuff you really don't want to know. Okay. <clears throat> then for, for all the simple expressions, well, self-evaluating expressions just return themselves. And here's the declaration saying, if you're a self-evaluating expression, then call this handler. And then there's for variables, well, the same sort of thing. And for quoted expressions and the same sort of thing and so on. And I'm not going to bore you with the whole thing. But the interesting part is this. Okay. The first place where something matters about layering is if. Okay, and that's because, again, I have to be able to route the information for, say, provenance from the predicate part, from the value of the predicate to, the, to, to be able to, um, to be combined with, by union, the value of the consequent okay, or the alternative. Okay, so besides all the normal things you would do for an if, which is here's, a, here's, an, here's an execution procedure for it, okay, which would normally just say, uh, if it's not layered, do a decide, okay? But if it's layered, oh, I have to first of all force the predicate value, and if if that's a layered value, I do something different. But if I if it's a not a layered value, I do a simple decide, which is if the predicate value is true, then do the consequent. Otherwise, do the alternative. But if it's a but if it's a layered value, I have to do something more interesting, which is a dispatch through using this if layers thing, which is actually a procedure, okay, and uh, this is this took a lot of thinking, okay. That's one of the so that's one of the places where interesting things happen. Now the essence of the matter, of course, is in is in dispatch because first of all, that's what this guy is doing. He got to do have to have to run a basically a a layered procedure, okay. So a layered procedure with arguments, well. I have to find out what the layers are available there. I have to pick out the layer available layers on the arguments. I have to, I want to fold those together. I want to find out which they have in common. Okay. And then I'm going to evaluate um, uh, the, 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 for each layer, I have to evaluate the, that, or that, that, the, the, that stuff. Okay. I have to apply, I have to apply the procedure for the, for the layered procedure for that layer. Okay. Not to say it right. And then I want to make a layered result of the results. So here's the continuation for that map. Okay. And uh, the applica the applicator is just the thing that calls the appropriate thing that uh, I'm assuming that all the all the oh I didn't indent this right. Gur. Gur. Okay, that's when I I see I was teching and uh, I didn't get rid of all the tabs. Gur. Oh well. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so the so the um, what this does is 
uh, if I've got a base layer there, then just do the ordinary base procedure. I'm assuming all procedures that are layered procedures have the base uh, layer is, or the, or the, what do you call them? The, uh, the layer, the layer level procedures, the, the sort of handlers for the layers are in fact strict procedures. They don't have, they don't have the lamb, uh, delays because that would make the thing more complicated, but I can do that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the uh, general apply for this thing is the, is the right one. So what I, all I do here is um, say, if it's a layered thing, then the way you apply it is by using this. Okay. So that's the entire, the entire ma manipulations required to the, make the evaluator work. Okay. So I'm going to say a little more about this. Okay, before uh, uh, proceeding. Uh, by the way, I seem to be talking rather fast. Is that right? Will, how much time do I have? Ah, Will's gone. Can people hear me? Hey, is this working? Yes, we hear you. Oh, good. How much time do I have? I'm just saying, I want to see what I'm doing. Nobody's keeping time. Okay. So anyway, here's the idea of the, uh, if you can hear me, the idea of layering seems like a right idea. Okay. It's a powerful way to factor a programming problem. Okay. It's dynamically extensible with metadata. It does not require a significant change to the base code. The idea is, isn't hard to approximate the way I did it just now. It needs a layered object data type, needs only small modifications to an interpreter or compiler, and the approximation is already is is already useful. I use it, for example, in uh, setting up the the uh, pr the primitive propagators in the propagator section of the book. Okay, but there are unsolved problems. A minor modification to apply, which doesn't worry me. The major modification to if there's a serious problem problem with tail recursion. Okay, and there's the conceptually easy but painful problem of I/O. Well, I'm not worried about the I/O. The real the real problem here is tail recursion. And then there's another important thing, which is how are we going to actually make programming use this kind of idea? Okay. Or how do we support that? Okay. What, how do you edit such a thing? How do you read it? I mean, you've got some sort of file with some complicated stuff in it. Okay. You don't really want to look at the, at the, at the, the whole ma major mess. So I'm thinking of something like org mode in Emacs is an inspiration, but wouldn't it be nice to have something that allows you to look at the layers in a, separately and yet make sure that they get edited to get to fit together right. That seems like a real big deal. Okay. So then, so I'm saying more, I need your help. Okay. The problem with tail recursion arises because the components of a layered procedure finish when they can finish their results are combined to make a layered object. But perhaps the idea of a layered object data structure is wrong. Suppose there should be no layered objects at all. Okay. I'm thinking about that, and I think it's possible. One thing, and one of the reasons why is because the way tail recursion works is there's really only one continuation up there, you know, that's that's collecting the result at the end. Okay, that's the guy who's waiting for the real answer. Okay, it seems to me that maybe that's the guy who should be should be somehow goosed up to um, collect multiple guys sending stuff to it. Okay, and yeah, and then it should it should uh, fit it all together. And I haven't figured out how to do that yet, but let's talk about it maybe. I mean, I'd like to get a whole bunch of everybody to work on this with me. One observation is, another thing is that um, sometimes we need to get the base argument and layer arguments for layer procedure to the layer handler for looking for zero in the provenance tracking model. Does that mean we have to combine the results or can be rad to the next set in some way? I was thinking the same thing. So perhaps there's some way of making multiple continuations do this, okay? So that's that's where I need your help for this business. I also think it's very important, okay, that that we support and contribute to free Libre software. By the way, the Free Software Foundation needs help. And uh, I want to point out that the book that uh, is currently being talked about and the previous books by by me and Jack and me and Hal, all are, all are, be all the software and it is free software and the um, and uh, the the copyright is Creative Commons share alike, okay, buy share alike. So I just want to say I I not only do I 
uh, talk the talk, but I'm walking the walk. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's it for it. For me, I think. Uh, let's see. Are there questions? By the way, how much time did I take? I have the foggiest idea. Uh, you took, well, a little less than 45 minutes. I'd say we started a little late, so probably 35 to 40 minutes. Good. See, I had no idea because I never talked about this before. Thank you. You, you took just the right amount of time since we started. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we, we have a question. Well, sort of a question, sort of a recommendation. Yes. Uh, from Mark Feely. In fact, let's see if I can invite oh, Mark up to the I can't stage. Even see what, I can't, let me get. Okay, me, I'll, I'll read it for you, but let me let me invite Mark. Uh, maybe Mark can. Okay, Mark, if you accept that invitation, maybe Mark can ask uh, Kurt make the suggestion. Okay. So, so Mark has a suggestion about your tail recursion problem. Oh, you good. Could. Okay, you're on, Mark. Yeah, I can't I'm hear you. Sorry. I think the uh, the, the washing know. machine is uh, is spinning, so I uh, hope you don't hear uh, the background noise. Um, so you mentioned tail recursion, uh, well, tail, tail call um, as being problematic, but I think you've sort of answered your own question because uh, continuation marks can be a solution where essentially the continuation is a place to store all of these uh, provenances and you only need one one level you don't need to accumulate these uh, frames you just need one and then you accumulate inside of that cell all of the provenances so that yep. solves the tail recursion problem i think you're right that's why i was and that's why i said that uh but i'm i haven't been i haven't actually written the code to do it that works that way. I'd like to. So I've, I've set up my interpreter so I can actually change the continuation structure. Okay. In other words, every continuation that I call can be itself be extended in some interesting way. Yeah. Well, so when we do you. that, it's basically all continuations are created as a with an empty cell. And Essentially, you mutate that cell whenever you need to add the, uh, a new provenance. Thank you. That's a or, or anything else. I can make that. Yes, that's exactly that's exactly what I was having in mind. Great. And uh, Arthur was pointing. You're, you're currently muted, Arthur, but I didn't know if you wanted to point out the, the Surfy. Yes, continuation marks. Yes, I I just wanted to mention the Surfy 157 is continuation marks. Okay. Now, who is that who just talked? I just want to write down who, who gave Mark me that. Feely. Mark Feely. Thank you. Right. Hi, Mark. From Mark. I just, my memory right. is no good for things like that. Okay. Okay. Yes. I just want to be able to say, well, if I figure it out, I'll, I'll write that down too for you. Yeah, but by the way, I was very pleased that you use this uh, analyze uh, function. Yes. It is basically uh, what I did for my master's. Uh, thesis a long time ago so that was a nice uh, it's also what's in at icp uh second edition yeah exactly yeah it's a it's a fun way it's a way basically of pulling part of the kind of compilation out mm -hmm. all the source level comp compilation we've done that that way there yeah anyway thank you that was I hope it was fun yeah all right thank you are there other questions, if you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A section of the, right next to the chat button, there's a Q&A button. Now, well, one question I have for you, Jerry, is, is there is there any connection here to saying like truth maintenance systems? What you were showing you, so it seemed more like you, you, you almost had like a prov provenance maintenance system or something like that. When used in this way, which was both forward, okay, for, for just an ordinary computation, I don't call it that, a truth maintenance system, okay? Mm -hmm. The truth maintenance is when there's, when, when, is appropriate in the propagation stuff or in doing logic where there's sort of feedback going the other way as well, where where the there's not, you know, X plus Y equals Z is not the same thing as set Z to X, and, uh, X plus Y, okay? So this is fun, this is just straight function application, okay? And I, I'm, and uh, yes, you're right. I use I use exactly the same mechanism in truth maintenance. And in fact, in the propagator section, which is chapter seven of our new book, okay, there is a there we we are in fact doing truth maintenance using using the 
uh, supports that propagation, but that's happening inside the propagators, which are multi-directional. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Uh, I, I see uh, Jeffrey Noth has, has a, a question, so I invite Jeffrey up to ask the question. Hi, Jeff. I guess. Yeah, I'll, I'll just read it. Um, so I deal with lots of data, like petabytes of data. So um, large computations will have lots of provenance. Does it get summarized or grouped? Some data, like weather observations, have lots of repetition. At work, uh, we, we're tracking a hurricane right now. We're modeling the atmosphere, and then we have algorithms with dozens of variables. We vary the inputs uh, one at a time to produce ensembles, which result in those spaghetti plots that you see weather broadcasters mention. I'm trying to figure out how all this provenance gets simplified and does not overwhelm without losing accountability. Yeah, I understand completely, and I'm very, I'm very, uh, I understand that problem. It's re it's a real, it's a really interesting one. Uh, one of the things I want to show you, though, is I go back here when I. There, when I signed the procedure, okay, I sealed it. Okay, so the internal computation, for example, there isn't any reference here to IRC. The computation inside that procedure does not have the provenance being being done. The only part that was that that of the provenance was the final result was signed by the the formula. Okay, and indeed, uh, indeed, what I want to do is make sure that that after you've wrapped something up, including with a data set, a data set remember. As Richard Greenblatt explained to me when I was a freshman, okay, data is just a dumb kind of procedure. You can ask it what its value is, or you can ask it to set itself. Okay, and the the thing the thing I'm thinking here is exactly the same thing. If I have a big data set, well, somebody can sign it, and when they've signed it, then the insides are no longer have to carry. You don't have to carry the informa the information about what's going on in the insides of it. Is that helpful? So it's who takes responsibility. Okay, next question, which is from Mark Andre, which is, did you publish code somewhere for us to look at? So is this something you're going to put online um, eventually? But you know, this the book. The book has this kind of code, and you can, you know, I, I, I consider this type of code to be trivial. You sort of write it yourself because <laughs> that's the only way you learn it anyway. You, the only way you understand this kind of thing. I apologize for that argument, but the reason why I, I don't feel like doing this is because it's not very good. I didn't write. I didn't do a good job on this. So, is this an exercise in one this, of your books? Something like it's, well, in, it's in like it. I don't have, have a no. There's one? no. There's in chapter six. There's a different set of ways of doing provenance and and uh, uh, and and units and dimensions and things like that. Okay, uh, and to say, you know, that's there are exercises there. Okay, and there's code online for the book. The book code line is all online. Okay, and all free and available. The the re this is just this is just something I threw together in the last few days. Okay, so yes, if I come if I come up with something I really like, yeah, I'll give it to you. Okay, it's not like I don't want I'm trying to hold it back. It's just I'm not proud of it. How's that? You got a good answer? Sounds good to me. Okay. <laughs> I say some thumbs up. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, by, by the way, Fari had uh, actually maybe maybe Fari we could bring Fari on for one second. Seems like we're bringing everyone up. I have joined that's the good. party here. It's yeah, so, to see people. That's right. That's right. It makes it feel more personal. Okay. So Fari, if maybe you'd be willing to. Uh, uh, share your suggestions for making the coalescence of data. Uh, I was thinking of some, some kind of hash crunching or or method to make the merging of uh, your metadata efficient and not explode in space. Oh, I see. I have not thought about that at all, but it's a useful uh, suggestion. Uh, thank you, Francois. Okay. Right? Okay. Uh, I would. Do you have? If you want to talk to me about it later, I'd like to hear about it. Okay. 
I think, are you easy to, do you live in the best Boston area? I forgot. Yeah, I, I'm still in the Boston area for now. So let's meet uh, whenever okay. COVID restrictions are lifted or. Yes, indeed. Okay, you know my, you know my home phone number and you also know my office phone number. Okay. Right. It's easy to get my, my office is just at MIT and that's where I spend most of my time. So Fare and Jerry, um, Jerry, do you remember Ken Anderson from 20 years ago? Oh, he was yeah. a BDN. Anyway, Julie might remember him. Yeah. Anyway, he, we had this thing called the data set manager and we would sign computations with uh md5 hashes at the time yes so i guess the only thing there is collisions yeah that's certainly a reasonable thing to do for a big data set okay i see oh okay so i see a comment from uh, john cowan uh, messy code is a lot better for the user than no code. If people only thought, uh, only taught what they understood perfectly, we'd essentially have no scientific advancement. He's grumbling at me. <laughs> That's right. Okay, it's all right. Uh, I, I I agree with you. Okay, but that's not the same thing as that's not the same thing as, um, you know, I I certainly will provide. And look, remember everything I've ever written is. Free Libre software, and then when it appears online, which it does quite often, okay, it is there for you to play with, okay. And, it's, and so don't 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 worry. I'm not trying to hide this stuff. I'm just not happy with this one yet. Give me a couple more weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to ask you to give another talk. <laughs> okay, I'll do that too. Okay, I, this is this was a whipped together talk. Okay. All right, uh, we probably have time for, um, oh, okay, well, here, here's one more comment from Mark Feely. I guess you're not ready to sign your code yet. Not this piece of code. <laughs> I'll, I'll sign the the interpreter, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I think I understand interpreters extremely well. Okay, I, can, I, I write them, they, they, that's the, the interpreter, the writing of the interpreter took me no more than two or three hours. Okay, of typing as fast as I could. Okay, but but figuring out exactly what goes on with the, with the input output, boy, that was a mess. <laughs> All right, well, our, our timing is basically perfect. Right. So thank you very much, Jerry. Okay. That was that was very hope interesting. It was fun. That's the it most was fun. Thing. Always, and... always the most important thing is to have fun. Don't That's ever right. don't ever let the let the let it become a pain in the ass work. <laughs> Programming has got to be fun. That's okay. Right. Okay. Well, uh, uh, sounds like there are some some people who have feedback for you, and maybe you would even uh, sure. hack, hack with you on on a. On well, a that's the goal. The goal yes. is to get a bunch of people into a room as soon as COVID's over, and we can all just right. hang out and and, and and stay up all night working on some of this stuff. I, I'd be happy to join you as well. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Jerry. Right. All right, I'm going to kick everyone off stage and invite John up. Good. Bye-bye. Can you kick me out too, please? Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's my, my privilege to kick you out. You can't kick yourself out with the software. You have to be kicked.